workers and the Most of our lecturers are overseas graduates and internationally recognized in research experiences. This faculty has produced graduates who are now well established as managers, conservationists, researchers, and lecturers. As a PhD student at this Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries at Hassan University, I have had access to a truly global scientific community, as well as an amazing biodiversity in the seas around us here. Study in Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries, Hassanuddin University, will bring you an international atmosphere of research and experiences. Welcome to Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries.
Oke, okay. we start now. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, the honorable guest speaker, Professor James John Bell, the honorable rector, Professor Jamal Din Jompa, and the honorable dean faculty of marine science and fisheries, Bapak Sarifuddin PhD. Dear distinguished guests, uh, academic colleagues and students, and also uh, participants uh, at the Zoom meeting. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to say Alhamdulillah, praise and gratitude due to Allah, the God Almighty, by whose grace that we could all gather here today in good health to attend a special lecture, which will be delivered by Professor James Bell. Also, peace be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam for guiding us from the darkness towards the light path. Dear everyone, it's very nice to see everyone here on offline. Uh, I think it's uh, students here are enthusiastic because uh, during the COVID for two years, we didn't have any guest lectures coming to visit us and give uh, lectures. So I think you are very lucky today to have uh, a very well-known and prestigious Professor James Bell uh to be here with us um <clears throat> okay so the main agenda for today is the lecture titled the rise of sponges in the anthropocene by professor John james bell but before that there will be some remarks uh, uh sorry uh, before that uh, we will show a video about uh, the faculty of marine science uh oh okay sorry so not time for that Okay, so, um, okay, I, uh, yeah, uh, okay, I will continue with the remarks uh, for, <clears throat> for the, from the Dean Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries. Uh, so I will invite, uh, I would like to invite Bapak Shafruddin, uh, PhD, to deliver the welcoming speech. The time and floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. The honorable guest speaker, Professor James John Bell, the honorable rector of Hasanuddin University, Professor Jamaluddin Jompa, and all participants from distinguished guests, academic colleges, and as the Dean of Faculty of Marine Science, I am honored and more than delighted to welcome to welcome to the lecture of Professor James John Owell. Professor Bell is a professor of marine biology, School of Biological Science, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. The university is one of university in the top 100 as according the most recent ES World University ranking by subject. It is indeed our a great hour to have Professor Bell visiting us and deliver lecture, which I believe will give many benefits for everyone here. It means also that Professor Bell is supporting Hasanuddin University in world class university program. Professor Bell is a worldly knowledge a scientist for his uh, research highlighting the role of sponges in marine ecosystems and their response to environmental threats. And today, he will deliver a lecture titled The Rise of Sponges in the Anthropocene. We have Professor Bell will describe how 
marine sponges became the winner in our changing environmental with evidence from two decades of research. And we also explain how this would mean for the function of our marine ecosystem. In this uh, special event, allow me also to take this opportunity to uh, introduce you to our faculty, especially for Professor Bell and any of us who have yet visited the campus. Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries was established 20 years, 26 years ago, precisely 29 January 1996. It's among uh, 70 faculties in our university, and we have 113 lectures, among which 24 are uh, professors. It is consists to department, Department of Marine Science and Department of Fisheries. There are seven uh, undergraduate students, two master degree and one a doctoral degree with more than 2,000 uh, students. Besides active laboratory in Tamalandria campus, we also have marine station which located in the island of Baralompo, Makassar City, and this found in Baro Regency, a new campus also in the island of Selayar, where we conduct a vocational study program collaborated with the local uh, government since 2021. And finally, at the end of this uh, welcome speech, I would like to thank uh, Bapa, Rector of Hasanuddin University for the open uh, speech and the event coordinator, Dr. Tintawero and her team for a great effort and making this event happening. Special thanks and great appreciation to Professor James John Bell for the presentation and for spending the time and energy to share the knowledge and experiences with us. Hopefully we could continue our collaboration in the research and other uh, programs in the near uh, future. And for all participants, enjoy the lecture, and I wish you productive and successful day. Thank you very much for your attention. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Dr. Shafruddin. Next. Uh, I would like to invite the rector, our beloved rector, Professor JJ, to deliver his opening remarks. Time and floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure, uh, and it is indeed uh, also uh, a great honor to be with my college, my friend, actually my buddy as well. <laughs> uh, he's a long-term friend. How long have you been collaborating with you? 15 years, yeah? So uh, for a very, very long time uh, with Dave Smith a group, we were together in the field. And I'm so jealous, James, today that uh, you are still enjoying diving on the ribs while I have to take the responsibility to be a rector, which is, uh, well, this is very um, uh, kind of important position, but it's also becoming very administrative there. I don't spend enough time as I wish to go diving. Jadi, saudara-saudara uh, sekalian, para mahasiswa, ini adalah suatu kesempatan juga untuk uh, melihat sebenarnya uh, bagaimana sih 
kenapa kita harus bangga, kenapa kita harus merasa um, harus merasa uh, puas ya dengan pilihan kita masuk di kelautan perikanan karena ini adalah suatu jurusan yang sangat-sangat uh, uh, menurut saya ya ini uh, suatu jurusan yang sangat penting bukan hanya karena laut adalah 70% dari bumi ini tapi juga laut adalah tempat yang paling indah dan paling menantang secara ilmiah oleh karena itu uh, my, my friend uh, my, my supervisor once told me the best job that you can actually have is the one that you can enjoy but you need you get paid to enjoy it so james i think uh, we all happy here uh, we all inspire and we all motivated to keep our spirit energy attention and also friendship collaboration to be able to do the science to be able to understand coral reef especially today we are going to deeply um, understand a lot more about a sponge a group of animals that's very unique that uh, james will explain uh, i think uh, in more detail uh, in the past we actually collaborating with not only me but also prof haris tepuk tangan buat prof haris dan ibu sinta as well yeah I think the four of us, as uh, most of the time uh, on the paper together. So uh, we do hope, James, that uh, in the future we can have a lot more scientists from uh, New Zealand. We are now a lot more flexible in terms of receiving more students. Uh, we can even offer um, collaborative scholarship. Yeah to enable uh, your students coming to UNHAS. And we promise this time to take care better for your student. I know last time we have a hiccup for the permit. We have a problems uh, of all of the samples. But now I think bring uh, a lot more uh, collaborative and uh, cooperative in terms of uh, international collaboration. So uh, Bapak, Ibu, teman-teman, Pak Dekan yang saya hormati, ini adalah satu kesempatan This is a very good opportunity to make our faculty also in a higher uh, position in terms of not only world university ranking, but also national uh, ranking, because we supposed to have the best faculty of marine science and fisheries in Indonesia. Tepuk tangan buat UNHAS, ya. Why? Kenapa? Kita berada di wilayah yang paling kaya. So, I would like to really request to James and please deliver my request and uh, also uh, wish yeah, that we would like to put UNHAS as the best faculty of marine science and fisheries in Indonesia because we are really in the middle of the richest biodiversity of this planet. UNHAS itu berada di tengah-tengah kawasan lautan yang terkaya biodiversitasnya bukan hanya di Indonesia, bukan hanya di Asia Tenggara, apalagi di Asia, bukan hanya di Asia Pasifik, tapi di seluruh planet yang kita sebut bumi ini. So we are the richest region in terms of marine biodiversity in this planet. So indeed, you are lucky, you are so needed to be able to protect this biodiversity. But in order to protect this biodiversity, in order to manage this, this biodiversity, the rich biodiversity, you need to understand. You need to have science. You need to have innovation. You need to have technology so that you guys, you all need it. That's why in Bali, in Denpasar, we have this Coral Triangle Center that keep conducting what we call marine protected area workshop, marine training. Now you are every day, you have the opportunity to discuss with the lectures, Every day we have opportunity to deepen our knowledge in marine science that is really as, as deep as the, the, the trench and the deep ocean and as rich as the biodiversity. Jadi kita ini sebenarnya berada di tempat yang paling kaya biodiversitasnya. Tidak ada artinya itu yang disebut dengan Great Barrier Reef. Sorry James, I know we are all connected to the Great Barrier Reef, but compared to our reefs here, we are a lot more richer. We are a lot more diverse, but
But of course, we are less uh, scientifically explored, but also we, we have problems in terms of uh, what we call uh, management effectiveness of the marine protected area and marine resources in general. Jadi um, ini adalah suatu hal yang mungkin uh, Bapak Ibu dosen melalui Pak Dekan, Bu Yayu dan semua Wakil Dekan, Pak Ical dan seluruh dosen yang berada di belakang ini adalah kesempatan untuk kita tunjukkan juga pada dunia bahwa ini memang tempat yang wajar, patut untuk kita dukung kelautan perikanannya karena kita berada di tempat yang paling kaya. Oleh karena itu melalui kerjasama dengan Pak Dekan, dengan uh, Ibu Ica, tidak datang Ibu Ica ya? Mantan dekan, daring, kalau dia dengar, kita lagi berusaha untuk kita punya uh, speedboat sendiri, mudah-mudahan awal tahun depan sudah ada ya, supaya kita bisa menikmati juga indahnya laut, semua harus bisa menyelam, semua harus bisa uh, menikmati, uh, dan sambil tentu sambil meneliti, ya bukan menikmati hanya lihat-lihat saja, lihat ada warna-warni, harus bisa dijelaskan, harus bisa dimengerti apa yang kita lihat. Tadi pagi saya mengajar ekologi laut bidang terumbu karang. Mas, mahasiswa kok masuk nggak ya? Sebagian ada yang tadi mahasiswa saya? Halo? Ada, angkat tangan tadi. Sebagian ya. Oh, semua yang hadir ya? Waduh. Anda muat? Ya, nanti Pak Dekan dipercepat selesai lantai empat ya. Supaya kita bisa... Ya, ini sudah permintaan rektor ini, jadi harusnya bisa lebih cepat. <laughs> ya. Gedung di sebelah itu dibangun pada saat saya awal-awal jadi dekat di sini, ya tahun 2013. Dan saya tidak mau hanya sekedar merenovasi bangunan yang ada, tapi saya mau kita memiliki suatu gedung yang megah juga seperti halnya fakultas lain. Walaupun lambat ya tidak apa-apa lah ya akhirnya pada pimpinan-pimpinan berikutnya bisa menjadikan gedung ini akan menjadi satu simbol kemajuan fakultas kita juga. Maybe I'm, I'm speaking too much. Sorry saya banyak sekali memberikan sambutan harus harusnya ini fokus pada materinya Pak James Bell. Tapi intinya saya sangat senang berada di sini dan ini agak unik juga. Biasanya begitu banyak foto saya beredar tapi yang gantikan adalah wakil rektor. Hari ini terbalik. Yang beredar fotonya wakil rektor, tapi yang gantikan adalah rektor. Pertama kali. Pertama kali. Oke, okay. so with, by all means, I would like to again welcome you, James, to your home. This is really, Pak James ini adalah rumahnya sendiri di sini, dan kita berharap your status will becoming a lot more formal this time. We'd like to make a special request to your university, maybe if we can request you to be kind of a young professor, whatever we call it later. But uh, with our new administration, we have a special uh, permit from the ministers to be able to really conduct what we call international young professorship. Yeah. Saya kira itu, uh, terima kasih Bu Yayu, saya kira tidak perlu dibuka secara resmi. Tidak perlu ya, cukup. Perlukah? Eh, kalau mau dibuka, mari kita sama-sama buka dengan membaca basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan sekaligus saya mohon pamit ya karena sudah harus mengisi acara di KKSS Jakarta. Kalau perlu ada foto bersama mungkin sebelum yeah, saya berangkat. Uh, ya, yeah. thank you to Professor JJ. Uh, but uh, we have uh, before James talk, we should take a picture first. This is also important <laughs> to take a picture together. Okay, everyone, get uh, stand up please.
to plug in Okay. Okay, uh I think we can start now. Bisa dimulai? Yeah. Okay, the main agenda today is uh, Professor James Bell's uh, lecture. So I would like to first express, uh, yeah, thank you to the Dean and also to the Rector for the uh, remarks. And before we proceed, I will read, read out James' biography so we get to know him closer. Uh, professor James Bell is a professor of marine biology, School of Biological Sciences, Victoria University of Wellington. Wellington is in New Zealand, okay? Um, so he studied for his undergraduate degree at the University of Wales, Bangor in North Wales. I think Ibu Ina is also from Wales, Bangor, yeah? Uh, there, over there, um, Ibu Ina, <laughs> for her master. <laughs> And <clears throat> so um, he earned his BSc honor first class degree uh, from North Wales, Bangor. And it was during his study that he became interested in sponges uh, and marine reserves as he went for a research expedition to Lark. Hain Marine Nature Reserve in Southern Ireland. Jadi dia pernah ke Ireland ambil uh, sarjana di sana untuk uh, dan mulai interested, mulai tertarik dengan sponge saat S1. After completing his BS, Bachelor of Science First Honor, he went back to Ireland to complete his PhD at University College Cork and focus on the unusual sponge assemblages in Loch Hain. In 2006, James became a senior lecturer in marine biology uh, and director of the Master of Marine Conservation Program at Victoria University, Wellington. In 2014, he was promoted to associate professor in marine biology and a professor of marine biology in 2019. He is currently the program director of all the marine biology program at VUW. His work is mainly focused on the ecology of sponges and temperate mesophotic reefs and have ongoing research projects across the world. And of course, including Indonesia. So, uh, jadi tadi sudah dijelaskan bagaimana uh, uh, Profesor Bell juga sudah uh, melakukan penelitian uh, kerjasama di Indonesia. And specifically in Wakatobi. Um, and we hope that with James' visit is a good sign for the continuity of the research collaboration. Uh, Professor Jones Bell also been engaged in a lot of teaching, research, and also publication. He teach a lot of courses, to name but a few, Applied Marine Biology, 
Introductory Marine Ecology and Tropical Marine Conservation Practice. Uh, his research supports the management and conservation of tropical and temperate marine ecosystems and strongly focus on sponge ecology. And he is the founding member of the Southern Euro Land Initiative and the editorial board for bioscience. He has published more than 150 papers and uh, to name but a few, uh, for the tropic sponge productivity may not be enhanced in a high seal carbon dioxide world and near future extreme temperature affect physiology, morphology and recruitment of the temperate sponge crustaceans. So James lecture today titled the rise of sponges in the Anthropocene as you can see here. And I'm sure he will not talk about the sponge that live in a pineapple under the sea, which is SpongeBob SquarePants. I don't know if you know that cartoon character, uh, Professor. Um, so, um, and he's, he will share with us his two decades research experience showing proofs how marine sponges can become the winners in our changing environment and what this would mean to the way how marine ecosystem functions. So without further ado, I will invite now Professor James Bell to deliver his lecture. Please, uh, Professor James. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming. It's amazing to to be somewhere with such a, a huge audience. Um, when we hold our seminars back in Wellington, we still, um, we still have very, very small numbers of, of students. So it's really fantastic to see you know, so many of you here um, interested to, to what I've, I'm gonna talk about. I'd um, also like to thank you, thank everybody at UNHAS for, for inviting me, and particularly um, Shinta for, uh, for arranging things, um, and also um, um, the rector, um, Prof Jamal, for, um, for uh, at the opening speech and the other opening speeches. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and come and tell you about my um, my work. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about some of the work that I've probably been doing over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, quite a lot of it centered on Indonesia. Um, quite a lot of it sent on centered on coral reefs in other parts of the world. Um, I should say I'm, I'm not particularly used to holding a microphone. Um, so no, normally when I'm holding a microphone, I'll be bursting into karaoke, but I'll I'll try to uh, to, to avoid doing that. Maybe maybe at the end. Um, no. Um, if, uh, if anyone's interested in learning more about what we do, our group, um, follow us on, yep. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so if, uh, if you want to know more about what we do and the work that we do on sponges, you can follow us on Instagram um, and you'll see all the, all the stuff that we, um, that we do. So my group, probably 90% works on sponges and maybe 10%, 15% works on other things as well. Um, we have a particular interest in kind of deeper water environments too. Um, so this is, this is a sponge. I'm sure many of you know what a sponge is. Maybe, maybe some of you don't know what a sponge is, but sponges are, are the oldest metazoan organisms on the planet. They have been around for at least 500 million years. There are some recent papers that suggest actually they may have been around for maybe eight or 900 million years, um, although that's still being debated in the, in the literature. Um, they're pretty amazing. They're a pretty simple organism. They're basically a, a sack of cells that are particularly specialized at uh, sucking in water and stripping out the particles. And some of these sponges, like some of the larger barrel sponges, may be hundreds to potentially even thousands of years old. The oldest sponges known are thought to be around um, about 7,000 to 8,000 years old. That's an individual sponge that sat there pumping water, sucking in water for all of that time. Um, so for those of you who don't know too much about what sponges are and what they do, this is a, a kind of uh, a, a diagrammatic representation of a sponge. So um, if I can just pull up my, uh, my mouse maybe. Um, sponges are, the surface of sponges are covered in little tiny usually microscopic pores. And these little pores are the areas where the water enters the sponge. So the sponge is essentially a big collection of cells that suck in water and then strip out the particles and then spew out the water again. So this is a, a close up of the, the surface of a sponge. And you can see there are these tiny pores, oh, tiny pores here, um, where the water is sucked in. We call these ostia. 
These osteo are lined with special cells called choanocytes. And these choanocytes are the cells that are responsible for creating the water current, so drawing the water into the sponge and for capturing the small particles as they pass through the sponges. So sponges only have maybe four or five different cell types, super simple, but super effective at what they do. If a sponge sucks in a particle, then the chances of it leaving are very, very slim. So sponges can, can, um, can strip particles at a retention, retention efficiency of up to you know, 90, 95%. So the sponges consume lots of different types of organic matter. They'll eat small plankton, they'll eat picoplankton, they'll eat bacteria. There's some evidence to suggest that they can consume viruses and they'll also eat detritus. And I'll come back to detritus in just a, just a minute. Um, this video just kind of demonstrates the, the reason that we work on sponges. And one of the most important functional roles and things that sponges do relate to this ability to process really large quantities of water. So what you're looking at here is a small sponge in a tank. The, the sponge is probably about half the size of my fist. And what we've sprayed into the tank is something called fluorescein. So it's fluorescein dye. Um, it doesn't harm the sponge, it just acts as a marker. And what you can see is very quickly, the fluorescein is sucked into the sponge and then is expelled. So if there were particles in that water, they would be stripped out by the choanocytes. So the sponge is able to process its own body volume in water every couple of minutes. So in sitting on the seafloor, it's sucking in really vast quantities of um, water. And as it does so, it strips out all of those particles, so all of the plankton and the bacteria. So it's really important from moving material that's in the water down onto the sea floor. And we'll talk about why that's important. Sponges do have other important functional roles. They do other things, but the filtering activity of sponges is the most important thing that they do. Um, the reason, one of the reasons that my group have become increasingly interested in sponges, not just in coral reefs, but also in New Zealand and colder water environments, is because we believe sponges make a really important link between what's going on in the water column, what's going on on the seafloor, and then linked back up to higher trophic levels, so fish and things further up the food chain. And the way that this works is something like this. So sponges are on the seafloor, pumping lots of water, taking out lots of small organic particles. These sponges start to create biomass, so things feed directly on the sponge. The sponges also produce a lot of material that they released, a lot of waste products, particularly in the form of mucus, which it often uses to get rid of the sediment on its surface, and also detritus as it wears out those choanocyte cells that I talked about before. So it uses up, and those choanocyte cells don't last very long, and they get lost from the sponge's detritus. What then happens is that detritus gets fed on by all those little tiny microscopic things that live on a reef, amphipods, copepods, echinoderms, all things that are kind of detritivores on the reef floor. And subsequently, those things get eaten by other stuff, particularly fish that are further up the food chain. So we believe that sponges have this really important role in making sure that there's nutrients and food available to organisms that are higher up the food chain. And that's where a lot of my research is focused at the moment. Just to um, kind of demonstrate that, this, this is a time-lapse photography of a sponge called Sveca spongia, um, taken in the Wakatobia over a couple of hours. Um, I've got a few of these, uh, these time-lapse videos. There was a, a period in time where we got, a few years back, a whole load of new GoPros, and um, were able to modify them so they could do slow-mo, long before, you know, now everything does slow-mo, and you can do it on your phone or everything. Um, so these were some of the first, um, the first, uh, first captured slow-motion pictures of a, or time-lapse photography of a sponge. Um, we used to think, well, everyone thinks sponges are fairly static, but if you actually look at the, the, um, the openings of the sponge, which is where the water comes out, you can see over time they actually change shape and they remodel over time. Um, we're not exactly sure why they do that. Um, that's a, an, another, another question, but they, they do do that. They, they do move effectively. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is the uh, holothurians that are moving around on the, the surface of the sponge, that are slowly but surely crawling around. They are feeding on the detritus that the sponge is producing. There are also lots of fish that kind of turn up. If you see the surface of the sponge, you can see it looks like it's covered in stuff and it's not covered in stuff. And that's because things are coming along and eating the mucus and detritus and stuff that's settling on, um, on the surface of the sponge. So we think that this link between sponges, the water column, and then back to higher trophic levels is really important. Cool. 
The other reason we think and work on sponges is because um, although on coral reefs, people are particularly focused usually on corals, that's not surprising because they are coral reefs. Um, we know from a number of review papers and work that we've done around the world, the sponges are a really important and abundant group of organisms on the seafloor throughout the world. So this was some results of uh, a review that we did a couple of years ago, looking at the abundance of sponges in different biogeographical regions. So looking at averages in different places in the world. And in most places in the world, sponges occupy in the shallow waters somewhere around about kind of 10 to 15% of the space. But once you go down deeper than that, into kind of 40, 50 meters, then sponges can have any or cover anything up to maybe 60, 70, 80% of the available surface. So below the, the kind of light zone where you get coral in tropical regions and algae in temperate regions, sponges pretty much dominate. I mean, just to, uh, just to demonstrate that, this is some data from the Wakatobi, collected with scuba divers and using a small little mini ROV that you can see in the picture there. Um, and what you're looking at, the graph shows the change in the abundance of coral and the change in the abundance of sponges with depth, the percentage cover that they occupy. Um, obviously, as you'd imagine at the surface where there's lots of light for photosynthesis, there are lots of corals. Then, and sponges are only about seven or eight percent. But as you go down to 50 meters and 70 meters, the corals become less abundant because there's no light anymore. And the sponges basically take over and make up you know, all the space that the, the corals leave behind. And this little video here is about, uh, is about 60, 70 meters in the Wakatobi. You'll notice there are lots of barrel sponges, but they are white in color. Um, and that's because barrel sponges have photosynthetic symbionts in their tissues. And the deeper barrel sponges don't have those symbionts because there's no light. So they look kind of bleach white, although they're actually um, very healthy. Um, just to, um, to, to introduce you a bit to some of the work that we do back in, in New Zealand to re-demonstrate this point of how abundant sponges are, um, what you're looking at here is a graph of sponge abundance for a number of different locations in New Zealand um, at a depth of about 40 or 50 metres. And you can see across all the locations we've sampled, sponge abundance ranges between about 25% of the surface covered to about 75% of the surface covered. So they're super abundant in rocky hard substratum environments. Um, I've also got a, a little bit of video. Um, this is video from, um, oh, it's gonna run, there we go. This is some video taken from about 70 or 80 meters at a place called the Poor Nights Marine Reserve um, at the top of New Zealand. There you can see the little dot where the location is. And pretty much all of those colorful dots and patches and branches, pretty much all of those are sponges. These are very sponge dominated environments. We see similar things with depth in, um, in Indonesia too. And you can see there's also a, a, a rare black coral. So each one of these colorful splatters is a, a different species and a, a different type of sponge. And um, you'll notice in the, the front of the picture there, we have a, a little grabby arm as well. Um, so this is taken with one of our ROVs. We have a, a number of ROVs at the university that we use to explore these slightly deeper, what we call mesophot mesophotic ecosystems. So just to um, kind of outline what it is that my group does. Um, so we've been working on sponges for nearly 20 years. There have been probably 30 or maybe 30 or 40 PhD students across that time. Um, similar numbers of master's students working on spongy stuff. Um, but all of what we do basically falls within into three main areas. The first of those is we're really interested from a purely ecological point of view. Um, we're interested in understanding what controls the abundance and variation in sponges, how they change through time and how they change through space. We're also really interested in trying to understand what the roles are of sponges. What is it they do in marine ecosystems? Why is it that they are important? And I think some of that early work that, that we've done has really, I guess, spurred us on to study sponges more because the more we look at sponges, the more we realize that they do really important things. More recently, the other thing, an area that we work on is trying to understand the impacts of human stresses on sponges. How will sponges respond to things like climate change? How will they respond to things like sedimentation um, and all those other you know, human mediated impacts? Everything from plastic pollution to nutrient impacts to climate change, ocean acidification. We've kind of worked on, on all those different things. But a really big driving force of my research over the last 10 years or so has focused on the potential for coral reefs as we know them now to change into reefs that are much more dominated by sponges. 
Now, it's really important I say here, I don't necessarily think that that's a good thing, that they change into reefs that are dominated by sponges, but it's a reality of what could happen if we continue to see the declines in coral cover that we see in, um, that we're seeing already in Indonesia and in other parts of the world. So a lot of my work is centered around trying to understand if sponges may be kind of future winners, if you like, and that's really the, the focus of my talk today. So I'm sure um, many of you will be aware of the, the major declines that we're seeing in coral abundance across the world. It doesn't really matter where you look in the world, coral has declined substantially over the last, uh, um, last 20, 30 years or so, um, all really in response to human impacts. Now, whereas the coral declines, it does create opportunities for other organisms to fill that space. So it means a, a provides a, a, an opportunity for, for organisms that are less abundant and that are competing with corals to potentially then take over or take up that space. That does rely on that organism's abundance being driven by its competition with coral. Um, but in many cases, we know that the organisms are restricted because of their, their relationship. So I want to talk through some of the evidence that we've been gathering over the last few years to support, I guess, my hypothesis that sponges may rise up in the Anthropocene and, uh, and be more, more abundant and you know, fill some of the spaces in which corals occupy. And the first bit of evidence I'd like to talk about is the geological evidence for ancient sponge reefs. So while I'm potentially proposing sponges might be a more dominant or the dominant fauna on coral reefs in the future, there is evidence from the geological past that this has happened in the past. Um, so I said that sponges are around 500 million years old, at least, maybe even more than that. There are numerous places in the world where sponge dominated reefs are recorded in the geological record. Studies from Austria, France, Peru, the USA and Morocco have all found stratigraphic sequences where sponges have dominated for at least millions, if not tens of millions of years. Probably the most well-known one of those is the um, last Jurassic, Jurassic, Triassic um, boundary about 200 million years ago, where interestingly, the oceans became more acidic and the, uh, the, the corals died off. And we know from looking at the rocks that sponges were the thing that basically replaced them and persisted for tens of millions of years. So there is, there is um, I guess, uh, precedent, if you like, for sponges to be winners when corals decline. So it has happened in the past. So coming back to the future, are there examples out there already where sponges have taken over on coral reefs? And the answer to that is yes. And I'd just like to describe a, a couple of those where we've been working. So first of all, this, um, this diagram, it's a bit small possibly, um, but you can see that, hopefully you can see that the yellow dots on this diagram at least. And um, this was from a review we published last year recording all the places on coral reefs where different types of animals had replaced corals when corals died off. Um, and one of the groups that comes out as the most abundant being reported when there are large scale die offs of coral, um, other than algae, you all know probably about that algal transformations that we've seen on coral reefs. But when animals take over, sponges tend to be the thing that is the most common transition. So a couple of locations where I've been lucky enough to visit where we've seen, um, we've seen sponge transitions. The first of these is, um, is Palmyra Atoll. Um, if you ever get out of Indonesia and want to visit another coral reef place that is really, really awesome, um, Palmyra Atoll is, is probably the place to go. It lies in the central Pacific. It is, uh, a, I guess, like Indonesia, it is a biodiversity hotspot, and it has very much a full trophic structure, meaning that there are, there's really good coral cover, there are a cropper of heads that are half the size of this room, been there for thousands of years. There are large pelagic fish. There are lots of sharks. This picture in the corner here is, is literally the, the, picture I, the picture I took on the first day as I rolled off the boat. And there are about 40 or 50 sharks just swimming, in, swimming beneath me. So it's a really amazing biodiversity place. However, it also has quite a, a dark history. So during World War II, the Americans um, took ownership. It was privately owned before that. The American army took ownership of Palmyra and they made a whole number of changes to the atoll. And this little picture at the top here is a picture I took in the lagoon of some unexploded something. I'm not quite sure what it was. I didn't want to get too close and scratch the sides to see in case it exploded in front of me. But the, the whole atoll is littered with things 
and marks that the US Army left behind. Um, for example, you can see, make the mouse work, over here you can see that there is a, a channel that looks like a kind of perfect channel into the lagoon. The Americans blasted that into the lagoon so they could take their big boats in. Um, all the lagoon areas of the atoll itself were dredged, so they would have been very shallow, um, lots of really delicate branching corals, um, but they dredged all of that and they used that to, uh, to make the runway and made the uh, lagoons down to about 50 meters so they could bring their boats in with their troops. They also, um, they also used the material from the lagoons to build up all of the, um, all of the, uh, the area that you can see that looks like land all the way around the atoll. This atoll didn't have places before then or many places where you could, um, you could kind of walk. It was like all um, would get covered over by water. So they made these, um, these really, big, uh, really big land masses all around the atoll. And what it left, unfortunately, in the atoll itself is a really murky, low visibility environment, lots of hard substrate, lots of hard rock, but no coral living on it. Um, so while everybody else was out in Palmyra probably five or six years ago, staring at all of those amazing sharks and working on the big coral, I was in the really murky lagoon with all the tiger sharks um, looking at the sponges that are there. Um, and this shows some data from a number of different locations in Palmyra. And the graph at the top shows the percentage of the seafloor covered in sponges at a number of different locations. And hopefully the thing that jumps out at you is that all of these, um, uh, all of these sites have coral cover, sorry, have sponge cover somewhere around about 30 to 40%. Um, if you go out on the reefs outside of Palmyra, there are actually very few sponges there. And sponge cover is only about one to 3%. So the lagoon, lagoon area is completely dominated by sponges. We know that it was once dominated by coral because that was all dredged out. And now because of the murky environment, the coral can't come back and the sponges have pretty much taken over um, and dominated this environment. We also know that a lot of those sponges weren't there before the Americans came along because a number of the species are not, in, not found or non-indigenous to Palmyra. So they're, in, they're invasive and introduced species from elsewhere. So we know that they weren't there beforehand. I'm coming a little bit further to home to Indonesia, which is, I guess, where I've worked a lot since 2002. Lots of large numbers of students working in the Wakatobi over the years. Um, and one of the things we've been really interested in is the changes that we've seen in the Wakatobi. Um, so this is some data for coral abundance in the Wakatobi across from 2002 to 2007. And then I'll just add a, a small update from 2016. And hopefully what you can see, these are data from different sites. Um, you can see that there's been quite a marked decline in, in coral abundance as we've gone through time. Um, so when I first started in the Wakatobi, most of the sites had coral cover up at 40 to 50%. Um, by the time, you know, nearly 15 years later when we were surveying, you can see some of those sites have, you know, lost maybe 75 to 80 percent of their coral cover. And I should say, it sounds really bad to people sometimes when I say, um, when I was there, first of all, you know, it was really, really, really high coral cover and now it isn't. I should say I didn't have anything to do with that decline. OK, it's just just a coincidence that that was when I was um, I was first there. Um, but it is it is it is kind of kind of sad. You know, these reefs are under a lot of impact. You can see there was a particular year between, I think it was 2005 and 2006 or 2004, 2005, when there was a, a really big, really quite rapid decline in coral cover. Um, I particularly like to draw your, your attention to this site over here, which is called SAM, um, which is also um, short for Sampella. And um, Sampella reefs are very close to a, a Bajau village, so they experience really quite high level of nutrients and sediment. Um, and this is a really interesting site, and we've done a lot of work here because it's really, really dominated in, in sponges. Um, so one particular sponge that we've been monitoring and is a really common Indo-Pacific species, occurs throughout Indonesia, Papua, um, and further afield across the Coral Triangle, is um, this species on the, what is it on the left for you, on the right. Um, this is Lamella dicidia herbacea, a really common species in the Wakatobi and really, really common elsewhere. And we've been monitoring changes in abundance of this species over time because we think it's becoming more abundant at this Sampella site where the corals have declined down to about 5%. Um, the red shows the data from Sampella in 2003, and you can see at five meters, 10 meters, and on the reef flats, there's been quite large increases over a kind of 10 year period. Bearing in mind, sponges generally quite, grow quite slowly, and they're not mostly fast growing organisms, but on the, uh, on the reef flat, we've seen increases from about 15 to about 25% cover. I had a student a few years ago who took a more detailed approach to sampling um, uh, lamella dicidia to see if it was increasing. 
Um, and what you can see here is the graphs from Sampella on the reef flat in particular, but also at five meters and to a lower extent at 10 meters, look like that they're on a kind of upward trajectory. So as the corals have declined, this species is slowly marching along, increasing the size of the, of the amount of space that it occupies on the reef. And we expect that to continue until it uses up and occupies all the space. Um, there are three dots and three other data points at the bottom of this graph, uh, just down here at uh, Hoga Reef. This is some monitoring of the same species at a different site where there is still high coral cover. And at that site, there has been no increase in the abundance of this species. So the increase has only been reported at the site which is really heavily degraded. Interestingly as well, this site, Sampella, is also really dominated by lots of other sponges too, particularly the giant barrel sponges. There are huge populations of small, medium and large barrel sponges there. They seem to really like the, the sedimentation. The other part of this story is really based around the responses of, of sponges to environmental stress. For sponges to be the dominant fauna in the future, um, it means that they need to be resilient to some of the impacts that causes declines and stress to corals. And I can split those into kind of resilience to um, local impacts, things that as managers you can actually manage, and sponge resilience to larger scale impacts, which are things like climate change and ocean acidification. We've done a lot of work over the years, a lot of experiments with sponges, not so many in Indonesia because it's technically challenging to conduct experiments out in the field. Um, but we've done quite a lot of experiments with, um, with giant barrel sponges, which are probably the, the hardest species to work with because they're so big. Some of them are you know, this tall. I um, mean, if you want to measure respiration as a stress response, you need a really big, um, really big giant respiration chamber. But we've pretty much um, exposed these barrel sponges to all sorts of sediment treatments. And they live in these sedimented environments like Sampella because they're really, really good at dealing with sediment stress. And that little inset diagram that you can see there is again, this is when we first got our GoPro and we were able to do slow-mo. Um, we used to find that if we put sediment inside barrel sponges, so like it was settling from above, when we come back two hours later, we no longer found any sediment inside the sponge. And we couldn't figure out why until we got our time-lapse photography on it. And what you're looking at in that little diagram, we've put some sediment in the sponge and you can see what looks like a little cloud forming. And what the sponge does is it produces a whole load of mucus that binds around the sediment, and then the sediment gets bound in that little cloud, and that little cloud flouts, floats out of the sponge um, and takes the sediment with it. It's a really cool mechanism for these species to, uh, to, to remove large amounts of sediment that fall on them. We've also done in the chamber, you can see there, we've also done uh, experiments where we put sediment in, um, uh, in suspension. So we've uh, got to refine sediment and see if it clogs up the sponge pores. And these sponges, again, seem to be able to deal with that. We've also done experiments with um, Lamella dicedia herbacea. That's that species I said that was becoming more abundant. Again, it's living in Sampella, which is a really sedimented um, environment. It, this sponge gets lots of sediment falling on its surface. And what we did is we saw the response of the sponge, we dumped sediment on it, and then we measured the, the response of that sponge. And what you're looking at with the little arrows is probably a little bit, little bit small to see. But again, what this sponge does is it produces mucus. So it produces mucus, which then sloths off the surface of the sponge and takes all the sediment with it, keeps it clean, so it enables it to carry on pumping that, um, that water. This graph here shows the results of an experiment where we got some sediment, we put it on these sponges in the lab, and then we looked after a certain number of days to see how much sediment was left. And what you can see is um, there are some sponges there over here that started with 60% cover. So we covered them over with 60%, and by four days' time, they pretty much had no sediment left on them. What we did find is that this is a, a relatively energetically expensive process. So when we, we measured respiration of these sponges, when we put the sediment on them, and what we found is when we first put the sediment on them, the sponges stopped pumping and stopped using energy. And that's probably because they're in shock and can't pump. Then after a day or so, the amount of energy they use increases, and that's likely because they start producing all of this mucus. So this mucus then is energetically expensive to produce, and they start to use energy. The energy consumption then stays the same over days two and three um, as it's producing mucus to get rid of the sediment. And then the respiration rate or the energy consumption decreases in the final day as it's got rid of all the sediment and it doesn't need to make any more mucus. So these sponges have really cool mechanisms to be able to deal with high levels of sediment stress. 
Um, we have looked at other stresses as well, particularly nutrients, and, um, and we also find that sponges seem to be really tolerant to those too. So I'm not going to talk more in, about any more of those, but what I want to talk about next is the ability for sponges to be resilient to large scale impacts. Now we all know about the threats of sea surface temperature increases and ocean acidification on corals. We know it's really bad for corals. So, um, so what, about, um, what about sponges? We were lucky enough a few years ago to, to get a really large amount of grant funding with some collaborators in the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences in Townsville. And we were lucky enough to be able to run some climate change stressor experiments in, um, in a facility called the Sea Simulator, which is a, a huge aquaria, probably about the same size as your building here, um, which is specifically built to run multi-stressor experiments. Um, and we took a whole load of common sponges from the Great Barrier Reef. I'm not going to talk about all the results because we'd be here for a really long time. Just one very specific result. Um, so we ran a whole load of experiments where we simulated the environmental conditions on the Great Barrier Reef for the next 100 years, depending on different uh, climate change scenarios. And we measured the responses of sponges to these stressors. These were some of the first multi-stressor experiments on sponges. So instead of just exposing them to just temperature or just ocean acidification, we were able to expose them to both those at the same time. Now I'm actually only going to talk about the results from one species um, of those species and one aspect of those results, because it really summarizes one of the really interesting things that we found. Probably one of the most important things we found is that sponges generally seem to be really tolerant to ocean acidification. So they do not care about ocean acidification at all, pretty much. Um, I'll talk about that in just the, the next slide too. Um, but here are some results for a phototrophic species called Carteria spongia foliations. And what I mean by phototrophic is, I mean, this species has symbionts that live within its tissues, which photosynthesize and produce the sponge with food. And what you're looking at here is the results from our, uh, one of our experiments for this particular, this particular species. Again, this is a, a really common species throughout the Great, Great Barrier Reef and also found in Indonesia too really ecologically important, usually found in the shallows, often in, um, in the kind of reef flat areas. So here's the results here. So the, the, along the bottom here, we've got temperature. So we ran three lots of temperature, 28 degrees, 30 degrees, and 31 and a half degrees, representing three future climate scenarios. We also, for each one of those temperatures, um, kept sponges at different pHs. So this is uh, a control, so this is normal pH. And as we drop, 7.6 is the pH we expect on the Great Barrier Reef under the worst case climate change scenarios. And what the, what the graph is showing is two measures of sponge stress. The first is necrosis, which is kind of when sponges go all manky and the tissue breaks down uh, and then they just kind of melt away. The second is, is bleaching, which is where the sponge, like a coral, loses its color because it loses the um, symbionts that live within its tissue. The first thing to know is here is that um, at, the, at the lowest temperature, normal temperature, um, when you reduce the pH to conditions that are likely in 100 years, basically there was no bleaching and no necrosis of tissue. Ocean acidification isn't a problem for sponges at all. When we get to the middle treatment, we find that actually, so at 30 degrees over here, we see that once we lower the pH to 7.6 at a slightly warmer temperature, we find that there is some impact, but again, it's very, very small. Now the interesting thing happened for these phototrophic sponges at the highest temperature here, at 31.5 degrees C. So this is the worst case climate change scenario, the worst um, relative concentration pathway scenario. And in this case, we found that at um, normal pH, so if the temperature is high and the pH is the same as it is today, sponges became very necrotic and they bleached, so they were really unhappy. However, as the pH decreased to 7.6, we found the, so here, we found that the proportion of sponges that were negatively impact decreased. So ocean acidification, when temperature is really high, has a, a kind of soothing effect on the sponge. So sponges, when they're exposed to high temperature alone, get badly hit. But when they're exposed to high temperature and ocean acidification, there is a kind of buffering effect. So there's an interactive effect. So it's not so bad. The same doesn't happen with corals. If you expose corals to high temperature, it's bad. If you expose corals to low pH, it's bad. And if you expose the two together, generally it's bad or even worse. And that's not the case for these phototrophic sponges. Um, I want to talk about um, one aspect of that. So one of the hypotheses that came from that work was that 
perhaps because these sponges have got photosymbionts living in their tissues, maybe those photosymbionts are more um, productive, which gives the sponge more energy to deal with the stress of high temperature. And the way we went out to, set, to test this is we were lucky enough to go to, sorry, run that again. We were lucky enough to go out to Papua New Guinea to some of the shallow water CO2 vents. So this is CO2 and a whole load of other stuff, but bubbling out of the seafloor. Um, if you put your um, if you put your hand or your egg in one of those um, those big um, smokers, and um, it would cook it for you pretty quickly. It's hundreds of degrees; it would burn you. Um, and we set up some experiments in the vicinity, some in situ experiments in the vicinity of those CO2 seeps. These seeps simulate conditions for ocean acidification in the future. And what we were interested in was whether or not sponges are more productive, are they produce more energy for the sponge under ocean acidification conditions. What we found is that wasn't quite as simple as that. So we did experiments on the reef like you saw, um, and there's me doing some experiments on the boat in the lab. Um, and what you're looking at is effectively the productivity of sponges at control sites away from the seep and at the seep sites. And what we found is there was no difference in the energy or the productivity of sponges at the seep compared to the control, but there was lots more variability for the seep. And what we think is happening is that sponges are actually stressed a little bit by ocean acidification, and they need to use that energy to, um, I guess, deal with the, the physiological processes. So they are more productive, but they need to use more energy to sustain themselves. So they're not actually productive, but they're able to deal with those conditions because of the, um, the photosymbionts. Um, just to kind of summarize some of the impacts of ocean acidification and climate change on sponges, a couple of years ago now, my group and I published um, uh, a review paper collating all the information on what we know about sponges and ocean acidification. Um, and we basically classified the responses of sponges in three ways. We classified them as there being no effect of ocean acidification, some negative impacts, and some positive impacts of ocean acidification. And there's a large number of species that are set to benefit from the oceans being more acidic. Um, particularly as a result of bioeroding sponges. So I've not mentioned these yet, but these are a group of sponges which have the ability to chew down through the coral substrate. And their ability to erode substrate actually increases in response to, um, to, to ocean acidification. So ocean acidification, not too bad for sponges. Temperature, on the other hand, is a little bit of a different picture. If you heat most sponges up, this is a single stressor experiment, just heat them up, most sponges don't like it and they die fairly quickly. The interesting things come though from the results of these interactive experiments, looking at the combination of ocean um, warming and acidification. There are a couple of studies that show negative effects. There are also though a lot of studies that show no effects when sponges experience these two stresses at the same time. Uh, and a few sponges, as I say, are actually positively impacted by the combination of ocean acidification and, um, and ocean warming. So things aren't too bad for sponges, and they are able to cope with future ocean acidification and um, ocean warming conditions. Um, if we compare that with what we know about corals in the same review, for ocean warming, and I kind of mentioned this already, but for ocean warming and ocean acidification, um, there are very few positive effects for any coral species. And about 70 to 80% of the studies show negative impacts of ocean warming or ocean acidification based on future scenarios, with only a small proportion showing a, a kind of negative or sorry, showing a neutral effect. And the same pattern is true when, um, when you compare the two together. So there are quite different responses at the phyla level between corals and sponges. Corals, there is evidence that they can survive and cope with ocean acidification and temperature rises, whereas corals almost certainly can't. So that kind of sums up that idea that, that sponges have the potential to, um, to, to do better in the future. So another big feature of uh, the work that we do is not just around you know, sticking sponges in aquaria and see what happens, the other thing we're really interested in doing is trying to figure out how a sponge dominated reef might actually function. So what I said at the beginning, I wasn't necessarily saying, you know, a sponge reef is a good or bad thing. It may be it's a reality for many coral reefs. And what my group are interested in finding out is whether or not these reefs will provide some of the same resources to humans as reefs that are dominated by corals. And there are a number of processes that we think will be affected by a shift to a sponge dominated reef. And we've been investigating this. Um, this was one of the main focuses of our work prior to, um, to COVID. We think one of the main things that will be, in, it will be impacted is the way the organisms and sponges interact with the water column, particularly because of that suspension feeding. 
And also related to that, their trophic relationships with other organisms. We think that the fish and types of fish will, will alter quite considerably. And I'll tell you a little bit about, about that briefly. Maybe. So um, one of the things we've been doing to try and understand that is to create 3D models of reefs, of sponge dominated reefs versus coral dominated reefs, and look to see whether or not the habitat complexity is influenced by shifts from coral dominated to sponge dominated reefs. What we found is that when we go and look, so what you're looking at there is pictures, one meter square pictures of a reef that's really got loads of sponges compared to reefs that have got really loads of coral. And what we find is that sponge reefs do have lots of larger spaces where things can live. But the problem with the sponge dominated reefs is they don't have those really small, tiny spaces. And those really small, tiny spaces are really important for all the juvenile fish, really all the little tiny little things which form the basis of the food chain. So what we found is, you know, that sponge dominated reefs are likely to have fish, but they won't have so many fish. The productivity is likely to be reduced. The other techniques that we've been using to, um, to study the, uh, the impact of shifts to sponge to sponge reefs from coral reefs is how the, how the food will kind of flow in a sponge dominated reef. And the way we've been doing that is using stable isotope analysis. And this is um, some stable isotope analysis from uh, Sampella, that sponge dominated reef I talked to you about before, and some uh, data from Hoga, which is a, a coral dominated reef nearby. And the different colors on these two plots represent data uh, from different species of fish. And the size of the circles represents the breadth of the diet for those different species. And hopefully what you can see, so there's some um, different species that feed mostly on coral, some that are a bit more generalist. But hopefully what you can see is for each one of these circles, uh, for example, this one, you can see the circles are larger on the sponge dominated reef compared to the coral dominated reef. And what this means is that fish have a much broader, wider diet. So spending more time looking for food on the, on the sponge dominated reef than the coral dominated reef. So it's, it means that the, the diets are changing. So the things have got to look much harder for their food, which probably means there's less food around, which probably means that overall that reef is going to have less fish on it compared to one that's dominated by, by coral. So obviously this is a, a real problem. Coastal communities are very much dependent on coral reefs for food. If we get these shifts more to sponge dominated states, then the productivity of these reefs is likely to be substantially reduced. Um, I just want to finish, oh, disappeared. Try that again. Okay, one last bit. Um, so I just wanted to talk about one last thing, which kind of completely goes against the hypothesis that I suggested to you at the start, the sponges may take over. Um, and it's based on some work from, um, from New Zealand just in the last, uh, last two or three months or so. So what you're looking at here is a whole load of sponges that are common in New Zealand and have been recently really negatively impacted by marine heat waves that we've been seeing. So people are probably familiar in Indonesia and other tropical areas of kind of coral bleaching events as a result of um, extreme temperature events. Well, increasingly, we're now seeing those in temperate systems as well, like New Zealand. And what you're looking at at the top here is a, is a cup, cup sponge. Um, and this is uh, not normally white, it's all bleached. Um, what you're looking at here, this gray sponge has got kind of white bits over it, so is this one. These are literally kind of melting off the, um, off the rock surface. And these are all sponges that we recorded as a result of some pretty serious heat waves that occurred in May this year. So while in temperate regions, sorry, while in tropical regions, sponges may be able to tolerate the impacts of heat and climate change and ocean acidification, we don't think that that's necessarily the case in temperate regions like New Zealand. So what you're looking at here is the, um, uh, the heat wave data from, um, from three different locations in New Zealand. My point is not working particularly well. Um, but basically, these three different regions, this represents this top graph is from the north of New Zealand. So it's from this area over here. This middle graph is from the middle of New Zealand, which is where I'm from, in case you didn't know where Wellington is. It's about here. Um, and this bottom one is from, um, from Fiordland. Um, which is a region to the bottom, to the south of New Zealand, over here. Um, and each one of these little circles here represents the intensity and duration, if you like, of marine heat waves that we've had over the last 20 or 30 years. And what you can see is most of them are blue, and you know, which represents that there hasn't really been any significant heat waves. However, in May this year, um, just past, 
we saw very extreme heat waves at the south end of New Zealand, represented by this red um, blob, and to the north of New Zealand, represented by this yellow blob. Much higher, much stronger, much more intense than anything we'd seen in New Zealand. And we estimate at the moment that something like uh, maybe 10 to 20 million sponges were impacted negatively by this event. So pretty much really large numbers of sponges have been impacted. So it means that, you know, while climate change in, in temperate in tropical regions, you know, may favor sponges, any climate stress in, in um, temperate regions may be met with major declines in sponges. Um, so just to, to summarize what I've said, um, one thing that you should, I guess, know is that sponges are major, majorly underappreciated in marine ecosystems. They're super abundant in many places. There's evidence that they're increasing in abundance. Um, if you drop down below 40 or 50 meters, then you'll find that sponges are one of the most dominant organisms on rocky substrate, coral substrate, anywhere in the world. They are super abundant um, and they have really important functional roles. Their pumping activity is critical to the success of sponges and critical to the roles that they play in marine systems. Um, there is increasing evidence from my group and from others that sponges may at least persist longer on coral reefs if we continue to heat the planet up at the same rate than what corals will. They're certainly more resilient to stresses than what corals are generally. However, there is a limit to the amount of temperature or sediment stress that they're likely to be able to tolerate. Um, so sponge dominated reefs may not last forever. Um, if we do see these more of these shifts, it will have profound implications for food chains and the amount of resources that we can take from, um, we can take from reefs. And a whole range of ecosystem modeling that we've been doing really shows that sponge dominated reefs do support food, they do support fish, but not in anywhere near the quantities and levels of productivity you see for coral dominated reefs. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that um, many of the factors and things that I've worked on and many of the changes and drivers of change on coral reefs are the result of local scale. Transition at Palmyra and the transition at, uh, in the Wakatobi are largely the result of, um, of local scale impacts on those reefs. And as managers, those are things that people like you can control. You know, there are things, there are levers that can be pulled from a management perspective, which means that you're able to reduce or stop those changes from occurring. Okay, thank you very much for having me. As I said, it's great to see such a great audience. It's also awesome to see people leaving and then you know, a whole lot of people coming in to fill up those seats. It's uh, like a, a, a relay lecture, no? but it's really great to, to get the opportunity to talk to you and be very happy to answer any questions. The one thing before I finish, I should say, is you know, there are also opportunities potentially for students to study at um, Victoria. And we have had uh, an Indonesian PhD student who's just finished, um, who had a LPDP scholarship to uh, study at Victoria, but also to conduct field work in Indonesia. So not, you know, isolated from Indonesia, but embedded in Indonesia for doing um, research. So, you know, there are opportunities to work within our, within our group. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much to Professor James Bell for a very nice and interesting uh, lecture. And maybe I can exp uh, a little bit more um, sum up uh, to, due to his uh, lecture. Uh, because, um, so, uh, jadi uh, tadi yang dijelaskan oleh, uh, mungkin uh, uh, mengerti semua kah tadi? Sudah ya? Oh, Oke. Okay. Jadi tidak perlu dijelaskan kembali ya. Ya, ya. Jadi tadi uh, Profesor James Bell bercerita tentang bagaimana uh, pentingnya uh, sponge, fungsi sponge di dalam ekosistem uh, laut, dan kemudian juga um, uh, bercerita tentang uh, faktor apa saja yang bisa mengontrol tentang uh, mengontrol abundance satu kelimpahan uh, sponge. Uh, dan juga uh, bagaimana pengaruh atau dampak uh, dari uh, aktivitas uh, manusia terhadap uh, kelimpahan uh, uh, sponge ini ya jadi uh, dampak aktivitas manusia juga dampak daripada uh, climate change ya karena kita ketahui juga sudah semakin uh, ada uh, uh, apa perubahan iklim yang uh, terjadi dan di situ uh, beliau menjelaskan bahwa Uh, ada beberapa uh, untuk uh, menjawab pertanyaan daripada apa sebenarnya dampak daripada climate change terhadap sponge ini. Beliau menjelaskan beberapa 
eksperimen yang telah dilakukan misalnya dengan mengkombinasi bagaimana dampak daripada ocean warming jadi pemanasan laut dikombinasi dengan peningkatan suhu ya jadi tadi mungkin ada di presentasinya ada beberapa perbedaan suhu yang diberikan yang diaplikasikan terhadap perkembangan atau pertumbuhan sponge ya Um, dan itu uh, merupakan uh, suhu yang dianggap bisa uh, yang diperkirakan akan uh, terjadi pada uh, lingkungan uh, laut kita ya. Jadi tadi ada sekitar 28 derajat Celcius, 30 dan uh, 31,5 uh, derajat Celcius. Dan uh, di situ uh, beliau menjelaskan bagaimana uh, pada uh, beberapa sponge itu sudah mulai uh, pada suhu um, tertentu sudah mulai menghilangi uh, sudah mulai hilang uh, warna ya karena kita ketahui kalau di bagian permukaan itu atau perairan yang dangkal itu uh, sponge itu ada sangat bervariasi warnanya tetapi um, karena ada simbiotik uh, fotosintetik uh, organisme yang uh, berada atau ya saling uh, bersimbiosis dengan sponge tetapi pada saat suhu mulai ditingkatkan uh, uh, nampak bahwa uh, mulai tidak mulai ada perubahan warna atau tidak berwarna lagi ini sponge-nya karena fotosintetik uh, uh, apa simbion simbion fotosintetik itu sudah mulai tidak bisa uh, uh, berkembang dengan uh, adanya suhu yang meningkat jadi dia mulai hilang uh, warnanya uh, dan pada dengan kombinasi suhu yang rendah dan pH yang rendah itu uh, tidak ada bleaching yang terjadi uh, jadi um, uh, seperti itu dan uh, Ya, kemudian juga ada beberapa selain itu ada juga eksperimen yang dilakukan, utamanya yang berkaitan juga dengan sedimen. Jadi tadi ada bagaimana dampak karena banyak aktivitas manusia sehingga sedimentasi bisa terjadi di sekitar pantai atau di perairan ekosistem laut kita. Dan tadi digambarkan bagaimana si sponge ini bisa menghasilkan semacam mukus atau lendir yang Uh, ya mereka melakukan eksperimen dan uh, uh, bagaimana sebenarnya ini si sponge bisa uh, survive. Jadi uh, uh, mereka memasukkan sedimen ke dalam. Jadi tadi itu ada semacam barrel sponge atau uh, ya uh, sponge. Mereka masukkan sedimen. Beberapa hari kemudian sedimennya hilang. Nah apa yang terjadi? Akhirnya mereka uh, uh, melihat dengan ada kalau tidak salah dia mention dia beliau singgung tentang penggunaan GoPro. Jadi GoPro yang meliput terus um, apa bagaimana si sponge ini bisa uh, menghilangkan ini sedimen yang ditumpah yang ditumpahkan masuk ke lubangnya ya dan ternyata uh, setelah hasil dari GoPro tersebut mereka melihat videonya ya di situ ada semacam mukus atau lendir yang dihasilkan oleh sponge ini yang uh, bisa mengambil uh, sedimen sedimen tersebut dan membawa keluarnya dan dari hasil um, dan di situ juga di situ juga ditambahkan penjelasan bahwa dari hasil ini dia bisa menghasilkan dari hasil pengambilan mukus ini mukus apa ada organisme yang mengambil sedimen ya jadi dengan mukus yang lendir yang dikeluarkan oleh sponge ini keluar dan hasil dari proses pengambilan sedimen itu juga terjadi penguraian sehingga bisa kemudian bisa menjadi makanan bagi organisme yang berada di sekitar. Jadi fungsi atau peranan sponge di dalam ekosistem itu juga bisa terjadi atau di, di, diketahui dari situ. Kemudian juga jadi sangat jadi sangat berguna juga ini ya pemanfaatan GoPro. Jadi kalau misalnya nanti ada 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 mahasiswa yang ingin melihat bagaimana sebenarnya suatu organisme bisa uh, bereaksi terhadap berbagai mungkin uh, faktor agetik atau biotik itu bisa juga melakukan dengan uh, pemanfaatan GoPro dan juga yang tadi dijelaskan tentang marine heatway atau gelombang panas yang biasanya terjadi di hanya di daerah tropis tapi uh, mereka sudah uh, temukan terjadi heatwaves juga di daerah uh, New Zealand utamanya di bagian selatan New Zealand bagian selatan dan itu Uh, mereka ingin melihat uh, bagaimana sebenarnya 
pengaruh daripada heat wave ini terhadap sponge pertumbuhan sponge di ini. Kemudian ya jadi tentunya tentunya mereka mengetahui bahwa sponge itu bisa sponge yang di daerah tropis itu bisa setidaknya bisa bertahan terhadap heat wave atau adanya gelombang panas ini. Tetapi untuk daerah yang Uga hari atau daerah dingin seperti New Zealand itu dengan adanya heat wave gelombang panas itu mereka tidak terlalu bisa mentolerir. Tetapi ya jadi seperti itu. Jadi banyak sekali dampak. Jadi itu beberapa dampak yang dari aktivitas manusia yang bisa berakibat terhadap sponge dan dan dari bukti-bukti tersebut juga telah dibuktikan bahwa Sponge sebenarnya sudah bisa bisa mengambil alih ekosistem laut, ya menggantikan karang. Jadi menurut beliau, apakah ini ini sebenarnya bukan pertanda yang baik atau bisa juga dipertandakan baik, tapi karena fungsi dari peranan sponge juga itu bisa tetap dipertahankan. Jadi saya kira seperti itu dan untuk sesi berikutnya. Sekarang kita akan buka sesi tanya jawab atau diskusi. Mungkin ada yang bisa Badan. di audience di sini atau lewat Zoom. Badan, Ibu Yayu. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, while uh, Professor Bell take a break uh, and we continue with the discussion session, we have to share the uh, list of attendance. For, for the participant filling out the attendance list of three minutes. Um, there is a... Have the bell card on the slide. Oh, for the... For the participants. For the participants yes. on the Zoom meeting? Uh, all, also? Yeah, also, also the in the online platform and also on the offline. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, for those who would like to uh, fill in the attendance list, it will be online for three minutes. So after three minutes, it will be closed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So please do so. Um, okay. So we can continue now if there is any questions. Uh, okay. Maybe from the audience in the Zoom meeting, uh, I will read if there is um some questions um oh yeah there's one question from uh radia uh um uh, he was uh alumni from hasanuddin university so she said, uh, thank you very much uh, for the very informative and amazing presentation, Professor James Bell. I have a question though. We learned that at the moment, apart from the climate change threats to the marine environment, one of the prominent threats today is the Anthropocene era, is the presence of plastic litter in the ocean. Has there been any significant impact studied associated with the presence of microplastics or plastic to the survival of sponges around the world? That's, a, that's, that's actually a really good question. So we, we literally just finished a very small scale, small scale study in Wellington looking at the plastic presence of uh, microplastic in, in sponges. And sponges do, and there's been one or two studies across the world, but still very little work done on plastics and, and sponges. We do know though that sponges do accumulate plastics. So they, they do at their, their filter feeders. So they take up various fibers and, um, and small plastic particles, but we don't yet know what the impact of those. For example, some of the fibers could get caught around those coanocytes, um, preventing or reducing pumping or reducing the efficiency of, um, of, of uptake of particles. Um, also a lot of those plastic particles have kind of toxins associated with them. So we don't know if those toxins may have impacts on sponges, but I think that's a you know a really important area of research. As I say, we we've done some work just recently in Wellington, and um and, and you know we we consider New Zealand to be kind of quite pristine in terms of our waters, but we still found microplastics in the sponges. I mean that might partly be because they filter so much water that eventually they're gonna they're gonna come across those particles. But yeah, it'd be a really great project for for Indonesian work. 
Yeah, um, I think also it will be like uh, from the direct uh, effect that we can see from uh, the plastics. It's like when they cover mm. the sponge, yeah, the, the surface, the, so yeah, they the cannot... Covering, the covering of the surface would be yeah. really bad as well because yeah. it would, it would, I guess it'd be like a like a cling film wrap, so yeah. the sponge would suck so in, but wouldn't be able to suck yeah, in the water. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you'd imagine so, that yeah. would make it go necrotic inside as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. it's potential for the larger mm. plastic stuff. Yeah, because uh, we know too. also that uh, litter, the plastic litter is like more abundant also. Yeah, yeah. That we can see directly. Yeah, and I guess oh. the abrasion on the surface of sponges may cause disease as yeah, well. So there's yeah. lots of potential for plastics to impact yeah. sponges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor James. So. Um, they would answer uh, Bu Radia uh, uh, question, and maybe from the audience. Okay, um, Pa Ipul, we have from the audience here. Pa Ipul is from our faculty. Uh, selamat pagi. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bell. Hi. Um, uh, can you explain us the diversity of the sponges affected by the uh, by the climate change? Is it a decreased species or or rise species as uh, the theme of this uh, lecture is rise sponges? Uh, and the second is, um, I was uh, in a great barrier reef in the close to the mainland. It's very uh, very cloudy cloudy waters on there and. Uh, uh, how is the response of, response of of the many species of the sponges there, and is the same uh, the same case in the Sampela also? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. The third is I was I was been in uh, Palmyra Atoll. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, uh, I was diving in the outside of the of the atoll, and uh, I never been diving in the inside. That uh, because there's many shark in there, uh -huh. yeah, many shark, and uh, there you is, can't uh, see them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, many shark in in the inside of the uh, lagoon. Um, can you com compare uh, if the the diversity of the sponges inside and the outside of the lagoon, lagoon is there a high diversity in the outside or inside lagoon? Uh, uh, in the Palmyra. Yeah. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your questions. I'll I'll go backwards because my I'll probably forgotten the first one, but I'll 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 go backwards because they stick in my head that way better. So so Palmyra is really interesting. It, the it, on the out outside of the reefs there are very very few sponges. So you have to search really hard on the outer reefs of Palmyra to find any sponges at all. And the diversity of sponges at Palmyra is much higher in the lagoon area than it is on the outer reefs. There's probably maybe 30 or 40 species that are common in the lagoon, whereas outside on Palmyra Reef, there's probably you know, five or six. There are no really large exposed sponges. They're probably under very heavy predation pressure, and they tend to be restricted to the underneaths of those um, kind of larger cropper heads. So, but a large number of those species in the Palmyra Lagoon are non-indigenous, so they, they shouldn't be there, um, and probably came with the Americans on the bottom of barges and boats and that kind of thing, yeah. Um, so the, the second question, your, your, your point is, is, um, is a really interesting one. So sponges seem to like sediment. So they, they, whereas, you know, you would think as a suspension feeding organism that sediment would be quite detrimental to them. Obviously, you think that it would get clogged in their, their filtering apparatus. But my experience is, is the best sponge assemblages are also often found in, um, in places where there are very high levels of sediment. Um, so San Pella has lots of sponges. There are other places in temperate regions in, in the world, particularly Ireland where I work, where it's really highly sedimented and it's spongy, you know, the sponges seem to be able to cope. They have mechanisms to get rid of the sediment through mucus production, but some of them seem to just be able to live buried beneath the sediment. And, and you know, some of them are actually buried down into the sediment. They still seem to do really well. So they have a whole range of mechanisms, I think, to, to deal with those kind of environments. And the third question about the rise of sponges, I, I, I think I got your point. I, I, see, I see that there will, I don't think the diversity will change. I, I think, if anything, the diversity will reduce in response to climate change. But I think there will be a smaller number of species that are really able to deal with those newer conditions. So our research has found not all sponges are really resilient to temperature, for example, when exposed to ocean acidification. Some, some still die off. So I think there'll be a, a smaller diversity but those that are there will be, will be really abundant and will take up the space between corals. 
One of, the, one of the unknowns at the moment for us is how important food availability is for sponges. Whether or not if there are more sponges, will there be enough food in the water column to support those sponges? Maybe not. If there's not enough food for them, then they're, they're not going to increase in abundance. They'll just stay the same. So yeah, it's an interesting kind of area to, to try and understand. But thank you for your questions. Hopefully that answers. Okay, very lucky to get to Palmyra. Uh, I, I obviously must be a bit braver than you, though, to go in the lagoon with all the sharks. <laughs> but there are lots of sharks in Palmyra, and the visibility is like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, lucky, probably. Uh, it's probably lucky that Pak Ipul didn't go into the lagoon, <laughs> so he's still here with us today. <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, is there any more question from the audience? Uh, Agil, is it Agil? Agil is a marine science student, uh, undergraduate. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I would like, I would like to say thank you to Miss Yayu to give me a change. Uh, good morning, Miss Professor Bell. Prof. Bell. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good morning, Professor Bell. Uh, it really interests me about the material today. I, I have uh, three questions. Basically, it connected uh, all of my questions. The first one, I see a potential about uh, we use a sponge to transplant to other uh, area, which this area have a uh, high sedimentation mm -hmm. to give the ecosystem back because in your last presentation, there is uh, a reset about a fish spend more time in a spawn, sponge reef area than in a coral reef area. So this can be uh, a hypothesis about we can uh, using a transplantation of sponge to give back a fish habit, habitat. And my second question is, it's interesting about we talk about the rise of sponges in this era because everything about human activation today uh, impact to our planet. And sponge have uh, ability to carbon reduce the carbon. So my question is how big the impact about sponge reduce the carbon activity? Because today uh, we have like issue with car carbon trade, which is it's full of mangrove, is the sponge can be solution of that. Mm -hmm. And my uh, third question is, the time is the rise of sponges in this era. I will say if in the future, sponge change uh, the coral function, is, is it have the same? Like coral have the uh, same? functions to to home for the fish like the nursing area the another uh, another function for the fish is this uh, sponge can change the coral functions mm -hmm. i think that's my question thanks for the chance okay thank you uh, to agil um, for the questions thank uh, did you get yeah, that? thank you. Um, yeah, good question. So uh, again, I'll, I'll kind of work backwards. So I think um, the, the, a sponge-dominated reef is going to be very different to a coral-dominated reef. It's going to be lower diversity. Um, there are going to be less complexity, so less reef complexity, which really is the, the kind of feature that supports the high biodiversity that we see on reefs generally. So sponges just don't create that kind of really interlocking three-dimensional environment with lots of places for small things to live. So you would expect the overall production from a reef that is dominated by sponges rather than corals to be different. You'd expect the diversity to be lower and probably fewer fish as well. So it will be quite, quite different. Um, the second question about carbon. So one of the things, sponges, sponges do store carbon themselves. So many are very long lived. Um, as I say, you know, those barrel sponges are, you know, maybe a thousand years old. Some people have estimated some of the huge ones this big. Um, so they do store some carbon but not in the, the kind of quantities that are likely to make a difference, I guess, to, to climate change in those, if they were sponge dominated reefs. Um, I guess the only thing that's gonna do that is if humans stop burning, stop burning carbon. Um, the final question about kind of restoration of reefs. 
Um, studies in the past have used, um, used sponges to naturally recover reefs that have been dominated or been destroyed by, by blast fishing. Um, one of the problems with blast fishing is you get all those fragments of coral and then they rub against each other and they stop the coral recruits from settling. So people have used sponges to restore reefs in that way by planting out sponges to stabilize the, the overall reef structure. Um, in terms of, I guess, restoring reefs and removing the sediment, the sponges probably, if you had an area that was really um, eutrophic, so had lots of, um, you know, was really green, like some of the areas out in um, out of Jakarta, um, out of the, the main harbour there, where it's green because there's so much phytoplankton, the sponges can help to control that. So in areas where there's lots of nutrients, more sponges or transplanting sponges may help to um, recycle and recover the water column. Um, but I think in terms of sediment, sponges can deal with the sediment, but I don't think they help solve the problem. That's kind of a figuring out where the sediment comes from to, to do that. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Hopefully that answers them. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you to Professor James Bell. Uh, is there any more from the audience? Uh, Bubidya? Um, uh, hi, James. I'm video for Marine Science Department. Uh, thank you very much for your amazing and insightful talk about sponges. Uh, but talking about sponges, we also have a professor in our department, uh, Professor Abdul Haris. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he, yeah, in the last year, <laughs> over there, in last year, he wrote and published a book about sponges and intensively. Uh, a word about and mention about uh, distribution of sponges in the world and especially in Indonesia also. Um, yeah, um, in your previous slide, you mentioned about the sponges have a symbiote microbes mm. in, uh, in their body. On, uh, yeah. Um, I just are very curious about is the uh, microbiome or microbes uh, community in the sponges have a difference or existence uh, between epipelagic or sunlight zone and uh, mesophotic zone. Because uh, in general, we know that uh, uh, microbes have uh, uh, play uh, important roles for sponges uh, as uh, for affect the marine environmental function. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a really, really great question. So I, I didn't talk much about sponge microbes. Um, we do a lot of work with sponge microbes, but it's important to, to probably say that, that pretty much everything that a sponge does is probably controlled by its microbes. So the relationship between sponges and their microbes is pretty much critical to everything they do. Um, and it's probably pretty critical to particularly their responses to climate stress um, and particularly temperature and ocean acidification stress. So sponges have um, different sponge species have their own complements of microbes. I mean, there are some types of species of microbes that are shared between different, sorry, between the same, sorry, shared between different sponge species. So there are kind of a core sponge microbiome that, that many different sponge species share, and then other microbes that are more specific to those species. Um, in response to your question as to whether or not they vary with depth, they do. So, um, but usually between species rather than within species. So usually within species, the microbiome is relatively stable um, until the sponge is really stressed. So we can collect the same sponge from lots of different environments and it'll have a similar microbiome. Um, and then we heat them up in the lab or do something to them and the microbiome changes. Um, but usually in the natural environment, there isn't a huge amount of variability within the same species unless they experience stress. Um, you do find differences in the abundance of microbes, particularly those phototrophic microbes or those photosymbionts with depth. Um, as the light changes, obviously, they, they disappear. A good example are the, the barrel sponges, the giant barrel sponges. So when you see them on the reef in the shallows, they have um, a really browny, greeny color. Um, and that's because in their surface tissues, they've got um, cyanobacteria. But they don't need those cyanobacteria because you also find barrel sponges at 100 meters, and they're bleached completely white and perfectly happy. Um, they probably maybe serve as a defense mechanism in the shallows from being eaten by fish that live there, possibly. Um, but yeah, so my, microbes are pretty critical to everything in sponges. And we do, we do a lot of work in our lab um, looking at microbial changes and also using metagenomics, using um, looking at microbial function as well. Um, but generally, metagenomics doesn't make for a, a, a good presentation in my experience. <laughs> Harder to, to explain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, a little okay. bit. A little bit. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so according to your uh, answer, um, I am one of uh, human resources that willing to join uh, with your research because I saw your uh, CV uh, that you sent to the committee. And um, yeah, uh, if you want, I, I, I want to join your uh, research and uh, identify the microbiome uh, in response with a molecular approach. Thank cool. you. Awesome. Okay, thank you, Vidya. Uh, next to Ibu Inaya. Hi. Yeah, and awesome. Oh, you were there when, when just slightly. Yeah, yeah. So I was there. I think I arrived there. No, I was in uh, 98, I think I was in yeah. Bangor. Yeah. Oh, no, maybe not. Um, similar time, church. You know, I was there in 90, 95, 96, maybe. Ah, hmm. uh, what the Close. subject that time? Uh, marine biology. Okay. Yeah. We are the same. Yeah. But I did, I'm doing the. Uh, Are you a master's? On, yes. Yeah. So I was still an undergraduate. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. Long time ago. Um, very interesting. Um, I also uh, teach students, undergraduate here, on uh, marine uh, invertebrates, mm -hmm. including sponges. So there's one, I think very important thing that you mentioned about how the mechanism of the um, uh, sponges to uh, uh, erat, uh, erate the uh, sediment. Mm -hmm. That's very, I mean, that the information is very, very important and very uh, interesting. Um, also, you show the, uh, the effect of the different uh, group of sponges, yeah, uh, the, the effect or uh, their uh, response to mm. ocean acidification with global warming. And you got uh, several groups. Um, is there any specific things that, you know, the groups uh, show you why this one got a positive effect and the other yeah. one is a negative effect? Um, in is is there anything about the spicules? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the sponges got spicules, others not. Some got fibers only. Is there anything? Uh, you know, uh, that's the first one. The second one, uh, from your long uh, explanation, seems like in normal conditions, sponges won't be um, overtake the uh, 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 coral and what your opinion about that mm -hmm. thank you okay thank you i'll start with the i'll start with the second one first again what's in my head um i i guess so there are a number of things that probably control sponge abundance on you know normal healthy reefs the first of those is probably um predation um second of those is probably food availability and then the third one is probably spatial competition um, a lot of my hypothesis of sponges taking over is related to that spatial competition. You know, the idea that sponges will be released from spatial competition with corals, and therefore that's why they'll have more access to space. Um, and that's generally what we see. Corals, if you look at the hierarchy of who grows, overgrows what, or who can defend space best, corals are probably, not always, but corals mostly are able to outcompete sponges for space. Um, the big question, I guess, on, on reefs is whether or not there is more food to support more sponges. And I think for, for sponges that don't have photosymbionts, that's a problem. But a lot of sponges have these microbial symbionts that are photosynthetic, and they're then less, less reliant on kind of food surrounding them. And probably it's the spatial competition that restricts their, their abundance. So I think on, on normal reefs that are balanced, there's a combination of food availability and spatial competition, um, and predation to a lesser extent that, that keeps things in check. I guess some of the problems with testing those hypotheses is it's very hard to find unimpacted reefs, um, particularly in Indonesia. You know, they're finding reefs where there are, you know, that it's natural, where there are full trophic structures and, um, and you know, the, the seafloor isn't damaged is, is really tricky now um, to, to test those hypotheses. So we have to kind of manipulate things to do that. Um, in response to your first question, um, I, it's actually similar probably to the response to the last question I had. It's all, it's all about the microbes, we think. So, we, so since we did that study, we have data, particularly on temperature, 
for a whole load of other species. And we think that the microbiome and the evolutionary history of the sponges is probably really important in their response to stresses, particularly temperature and ocean acidification. The, the kind of idea being that sponges have been around for 500 million years. They've experienced the conditions that we're getting today in the past at some point. And it's probably their relationships with microbes um, and the food and the detoxification mechanisms that microbes can provide um, and dealing with you know, um, excess radicals and those kind of things that makes some species more susceptible to others. We actually, we, we had a, a grant application, which we just found out a couple of days ago, we didn't get the money for to study that in a bit more, bit more detail because we think the evolution we have history of sponges are what is the link to understanding which species will survive in the future. Um, as I say, because they've, they've experienced these conditions before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. James. Um, are there any more questions? Do we have time for more questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe I can read up some from the chat room. Um, this one from Ibu Nur Abu. Um, thank you for your great presentation, Professor James. My question is, do you think sponges will replace coral in the future? Yes. <laughs> no, I, 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 I guess I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a climate change, very, very much a climate change pessimist. I, I struggle to see humans reducing their carbon output until we've burnt the last litre of fuel on the planet and it costs, I don't know, a billion dollars for that litre of fuel. Um, I think until, until humans just need to get on with it and burn it and then, you know. Uh, so I, I, think there's a, I think there is a lot of, lot of a likelihood that, that sponges will take over. I think it is also worth noting that there are other groups of organisms that will also do well. Um, octocorals, soft corals are also particularly tolerant to temperature and ocean acidification um, in a similar way to sponges. So they also represent another potential winner on coral reefs. There are parts of the Caribbean now that are really just dominated by soft corals and, and sponges. So I think, um, I think that there's a, a possibility that those organisms will certainly do better than corals or at least persist a little bit longer. I guess it depends on how, how hot the planet gets. Okay, thank you, Professor James. Um, yeah, I think I have uh, one question because uh, you mentioned about the, how uh, sponges became, in some parts became the dominant in some coral reefs when they are degraded, but some parts also are the, the the algae, macroalgae is mm. dominating. So what do you think? Is it macroalgae is more winner or yeah, sponges or? So, so there are definitely more reports of shifts to algal dominated reefs than there are shifts to mm. animal dominated reefs. Um, but I guess Indonesia and uh, lots of the Indo-Pacific, there seem to be lots of areas where there aren't shifts to these algal dominated reefs. And it's, it's kind of not what you expect. The, the textbook is that the coral disappears and the algae arrives because usually the coral disappears and the fish disappear to eat down the, the algae. So I, I think, yeah, there, there's something different. I wonder if it relates to nutrients, um, Indo-Pacific reefs, maybe not as nutrient rich as the Caribbean um, because it's a more enclosed system. Um, yeah, there's, I think there's a, there's a lot of discussion as to why some reefs transition to animal ones as opposed to algal ones. Yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. But I think that there are, there are definitely lots of algal dominated reefs yeah, around yeah. and more, more than there are sponge dominated reefs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the areas that seem to be particularly suited to sponges are ones where the water quality declines. So where there oh, is lots yeah. of sediment and then the uh, algae can't really do very well because there's not enough light. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Professor James. Uh, okay. Um, are there any more questions from the audience here? Okay, uh, please. Ada Bunda Ayu dari Zoom. Can you please wait? Uh, we have one. We'll give a chance to the Zoom uh, audience. Uh, please, Ibu Modi. Yeah, thank you, Ibu Ayu. Uh, yeah, hi, James. Hi. It was a long time. I have a uh, very great presentation. Remind me. Uh, to the first uh, in the early year that we start the collaboration uh, between UNHAS and uh, your university. Uh, yeah, um, uh, my first question actually is actually just, uh, you just uh, answered it. It's the same with the Nur Abu's question. Uh, 
uh, about the how to what extent in the future that sponges will uh, replace the coral. But I, you already explained it. Thank you very much. My second question is: um, uh, there are two opinion about the metabolite secondary as due to the a symbion of the sponges or it's from the sponges itself. So what your comment about that? Because some people believe that the microbes in the sponges is hold a very important role in uh, elaborating and producing the metabolite secondary uh, from the sponges itself. Do you have more comment on it? Thank yeah, you, thanks. James. Great to see you again on the big screen. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, so uh, I, I think most of us think that those secondary metabolites are, are probably from the associated microbial communities rather than the sponges themselves. And the sponges themselves are, are so simple compared to the complexity of the microbial communities that they support. So I think most people feel that it's probably the microbes, and which is probably good news because it means that we can culture those microbes to, um, to get to those, those chemicals rather than having to try and culture the sponges, which is typically much, much, much harder to keep the sponges alive in the lab. Yes, yeah, so I think that I think it's probably there may be some that are produced by the sponge, but I think a, a lot of them are a result of those microbial activities. And the bigger question is, is around why they produce that such a wide range of chemicals. I think that's a, a, a really important question to, to consider as well. Um, some of them may be for predation or to produce chemicals to, to stop things from settling on sponges. But the, there's such a large diversity of compounds that sponges produce. It's kind of amazing that they you know, produce so many. Um, yeah, we know very little about the functional roles of those compounds. Thank you for your question. Good to see you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, probably we, in the future, we, you, maybe you we also need to expand the collaboration between uh, our faculty as well. Even though my background was marine science, but I'm from the Department of Biology, a Faculty of Science. So right. I'll probably contact you separately to develop the collaboration. Thank you, James. Thanks. See, it's nice to see you again, even from the Thank uh, you. Yes, sama -sama, Bu. Uh, Thank you. Okay, next, uh, the students. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hi, Prof. James Kerr. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, so, I'm Fikri, one of students of Marine Science Department. Uh, I have one question. Actually, is the question appears when I look the title of this lecture, The Rise of Sponge in the Anthropocene. As we know, in our life now, is fetched by drastic uh, climate change. In the fact, uh, the, the sponge are still rising. Uh, so my question, will this sponge fall down in the anthropos anthropocene too in the future? Thank you. So, so the, sorry, I just missed the first bit of your question. Could you just uh, say the first bit again? Will sponges... Bisa diulangi pertanyaannya? Oh, uh, sorry. Yang pertama... Will this sponge fall down in the future? Yeah, that's a yeah, it's a, that's a good question. So I I, I guess my um my, my title is potentially a little bit misleading because I, I although I think sponges might take over and be more abundant when corals decline, I think there's a there's a limit to that growth of sponges and a limit to um where where you know how long sponges will last. Um, particularly because there's a big group of sponges that I didn't really talk too much about but the sponges that are responsible for bioeroding and breaking down the reef. Um, so obviously sponges need hard substrate to settle on and grow on. Um, and if bioeroding sponges and other things that break down calcium carbonate, microbes and other organisms do that, then there won't be any substrate for sponges to survive and live on um, if all of that coral reef structure actually dissolves and disappears. So the rise of sponges may be relatively short-lived after the corals go if there's no further substrate for the sponges to live on. So yeah, I think, I think the, the sponge reefs this time around won't be as long lasting as they have been in geological times. Um, but yeah, they, might not, they won't be here till the end. <laughs> might buy us a little bit more time maybe. Thank um, you for your question. So they may also be become a loser 
So yeah, so you I know, guess that'd be the last loser though. So last, that still makes oh, them the loser. last loser, but still the winner. Maybe. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Uh, anyone? Uh, any more questions? Ah, uh, oh, Ibu Nadiarti from the Zoom meeting. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Bu Yayu. Um, uh, James. Uh, I have a short question about your presentation. Um, because the the conclusion is that the climate change has uh, a positive impact on the sponge, especially in the tropical waters. But uh, then you say that it maybe will last looser, yeah. So is is there any possibilities to, I mean. When the sponge uh, will dominate uh, the coral, uh, it will have uh, imbalance in the nature, right? And we know the climate change, the, the rising temperature is going on and on. And is there any uh, challenges to how to, how to uh, control this uh, climate change? Uh, I mean, is there po is there any possibility to make uh, artificial environment for the spawns uh, to keep the uh, grow uh, in na naturally without over uh, over abundance uh, and keep trying to balance with the coral because uh, we know that coral is a home for uh, many uh, fauna and if the if the spawns will dominate is uh, do they also will uh, have an important role as a house for fishes or I don't know <laughs> I need uh, your comments on this. Thank one you. Of, one of the problems with sponges is generally we find they're very hard to kind of keep. So they don't do well in aquarium systems. If you start messing around with the natural water environment, they're very hard to keep. And um, I suspect um, I suspect in the future, if, if temperature and things still continue, I can see that there being programs to save small parts of coral reefs where we almost enclose coral reefs and we treat the water that goes in and out to cool it down and heat it up. I can see very small scale systems to do that, to preserve corals as kind of dynamic entities. Um, yes, but sponges probably would, might not like that. They like very fast flowing water. They like open water conditions. When you bring them into the lab, most species really, really decline quite quickly. Um, so we need a lot of, um, lot of careful thought. Um, I guess, as, you know, as I said in my talk, I don't think, um, I don't think sponge, reefs that have got more sponges on than corals probably aren't, just aren't gonna provide as many homes for fish. So it's probably just, it's not gonna be as a, as a kind of abundant, you know, fishy environment as what a coral reef is. So you will lose fish diversity and fish abundance associated with it. Um, but that's probably largely to do with a, a reduced amount of food that's available for those fish. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your question. Um, okay, we have a question from the Zoom meeting from, uh, I don't know if uh, from, uh, from UNHAS. Um, thank you for your great presentation, Professor James. I was curious about, since sponges are different with coral reef in terms of light penetration in the ocean, is there a difference in the diversity of sponges that live in the tropical and temperate region? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, so there, there are many more sponges. The diversity of sponges is much higher in Indonesia. There are many, many more species um, overall. The interesting thing is the, the amount of species you get per unit area is pretty similar and consistent across the world. So in a square meter in New Zealand, you get a similar number of sponge species as you get in a square meter in Indonesia. So the, the small scale low, the small scale, the small scale abundance of sponges is about the same. Um, if it, you look at a, a bigger kind of a, um, a better scale of, of diversity, there are many more species, but on a small scale, if you count how many sponge species there are in a one meter square in New Zealand, they're about the same as what they are in Indonesia. Um, what, we, what we're still trying to understand is, is what drives, again, the differences in susceptibility of temperate versus tropical sponges. 
And again, we think it might be related to evolutionary history and again to those, um, to those microbes. We think that they're, they're really important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor James. Um, um, is there anyone from the audience in the room? Okay, there's another. Oh, okay. Um, please, yes, Stephen. Okay, thank you. Let me introduce myself. Hi. I'm, my name is Ibn Reza. I'm from Department Marine Science. Okay, my question for Sir James. My question is, why sponge? You know, in the sea have a lot of life, but why in your focus research is sponge? That's my question. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that's a good question. I, I wake up many mornings asking myself exactly the same question. Why do I work on sponges? I, I usually actually start, start these kind of talks where I have a, a lot more text on why I work on sponges and I add to the list. And when I wake up one morning wondering why I work on sponges, I look at the list and think these are the reasons I do. The, the, the main reasons I work on sponges is one, I guess the, the, the reason I started working on sponges in the early days is I, I actually wanted to work on corals. But the coral world, there's loads of people working on corals. So, I, you know, I thought I'd work on something slightly different. But the main, I guess, ecological reasons I work on sponges is firstly because my group has increasingly shown that sponges are a really underestimated group of organisms in terms of their abundance. So people focus on other stuff in temperate regions in New Zealand, where I'm from. People work on kelp forests a lot. And that's because most people haven't explored what's beneath, deeper below kelp forests. Um, and we've shown using mini remotely operated vehicles that once you get down below where the kelp lives, these sponges are everywhere. They're the most dominant organism. And even in the shallow water environments, they're quite abundant too. Um, my group has also shown the ecological importance of that filtering activity. So how much carbon is cycled through sponges is significant. Um, we've shown in some locations where we've done really detailed studies, the sponges can turn over the total amount of water in the water column in a matter of weeks. So they're having an impact, a really strong impact on that, that benthic environment, so on that pelagic environment. So that kind of filtering role that they have and the fact that they're super abundant means that they're making really important ecological, um, uh, I guess, ecological contributions to the overall ecosystem. So those are probably the, the two, two main environments. Also, sponges are cool. Why, why don't you want to work on sponges? Much cooler than corals. And of course, I've now shown that they're going to be here longer than corals. So, you know, you have something to look at underwater, it'll be sponges. So it's good to, uh, good to get in there. The final reason, of course, as well, is that when all the corals disappear and there's only sponges left, all the research money in the world will need to come to me because everybody <laughs> will want to work on sponges because that's all they'll be. <laughs> yeah, good for sponges. <laughs> thank you for your question. Good one. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor James. Um, Okay, uh, there's another one question from the Zoom meeting from Ibu Baset Siang from uh, our faculty. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor James. I just want to know what is the difference between the life of coral, hard and soft and sponge and how the process of absorption of food occur on climate change? Okay, so the first question, I don't know a huge amount about soft corals, I'll, I'll, um, I'll admit. Um, many soft corals, though, are very fast growing, um, generally much faster than sponges. The majority of sponges are very slow growing, um, although some of the ones, you know, like barrel sponges, they grow, very, they grow quite slowly. I'm not super slowly, but the life, life cycle of um, a lot of the soft corals is much quicker, and they arrive quicker and they can take over that space quite, um, quite fast. And the second question about food and um, climate change, that's a, a really good question and a, an area where we're kind of actively exploring. Um, we don't know how climate change will impact sponge feeding, particularly temperature increases. Um, warming temperatures makes water easier to pump, so it may mean that sponges can feed easier, um, but those temperatures may also impact the food availability of sponges. So there's a lot of different predictions around the world as to how picoplankton might be impacted by climate change. So there may be more food, depending on which study you read in some places, or there may be less food available to sponges. Um, yeah, at the moment, we're, um, we're not super sure on that. The other thing about sponges is that um, not only do they feed on kind of small phytoplankton, they also, feed on, um, uh, they also feed on dissolved organic carbon as well. So dissolved organic carbon is obviously the 
the biggest pool of carbon in the oceans. And um, we don't know how the process of sponges taking up dissolved organic carbon will be impacted by that warming and ocean acidification. Again, a, a kind of future um, area of research for us. Thank you. So there's still a lot more to do research on sponges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, especially plenty more questions. There's always more questions. Be, especially it's going to be the winner of the <laughs> oceans. Uh, but I was wondering about um, also the, because you mentioned about how sponge uh, excrete mucus or produce mucus, because uh, I think I read that also corals produce mucus mm. to prevent sedimentation, but then they couldn't, um, but they only uh, could cope for like a short time. Yeah. And because it's like uh, uh, regarding the energy consumptions mm. also, and then the corals will die yeah. after that. But then after really uh, hearing your presentation that the sponge can actually- Yeah, they seem to be able to continually- yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. they must divert resources away from growth and other things, but mm. yeah, they seem to be able to just continually produce it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so- It's yes, amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite a cool yeah. discovery. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I think um, we don't. We are uh, done with the uh, questions and answers uh, sessions. So I will sum up, or you will do uh, final remarks. Yeah, I can just say you? final remarks. I, I guess um, once again, thank you so much for coming, and thanks to all those people who have joined in online. Um, I don't remember for many years having such a large audience and so many really great questions. It's obviously really great to be here in person and not be online myself. So um, thank you all for coming. I guess in, in terms of the science, our group is really interested in sponges because of those really important ecological roles that they fulfill. Um, and there is increasing evidence that sponges will at least be tolerant for a while, more than what, what coral reefs are. Um, so, and that will change the way if sponges become more, more dominant, same if other things take over like algae or soft coral, that will impact the way that coral reefs function. And I think we should be really aware of, you know, these changes that are going on in the environment because they're happening now. They're not happening in, you know, 20, 30 years time. They're already starting to happen. And we need to monitor those and to deal with them. The other thing that we can think about is reducing other impacts on coral reefs. So mm. overfishing, sediment stress, nutrient stress, plastic pollutions, um, those things we should try and control because it will make organisms more, um, um, more able to deal with the impacts of climate change if they're not experienced other stresses. Um, but thank you very, very much for coming. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor James Bell, uh, for a very nice and interesting uh, talk, lecture. So now um, there's a souvenir um, handout that will be given to Professor James Bell. And uh, professor, uh, oh, uh, 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 pa, Dr. Faisal, Ahmad Faisal will be giving the uh, souvenir. Please uh, come to the audience. As an appreciation, the, uh, we would like to give you a souvenir from our faculty. Okay, thank you. And next, another uh, appreciation to Professor James Bell, uh, which is uh, handing out the certificate of appreci appreciation from our dean, uh, Vice Dean Faculty, Prof. Harris, your old colleague, <laughs> co authors
day. Uh, I hope everyone have uh, really enjoyed the lecture and have something to bring back. So, uh, is there question? Oh, okay. So, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you also to the people joining the Zoom meeting. Thank you. Since founded in 1996, the Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries Hasanuddin University has produced thousands of alumni and has grown to become one of the leading institutions in Indonesia in the field.